So we're in this series called Joseph. Very clever title, I know. It's, it's amazing. But the life of Joseph has been one we have learned so much from. We've really gone through this narrative and followed his life, saw him in his deepest moments of suffering, of being what thought to be left for dead and sold into slavery, tempted at the highest level sexually by Potiphar's wife, and we saw his resilience by running from sexual temptation and resisting the temptation in front of him. And what did that get him? That got him prison. He was thrown in jail for his actions. And in jail, he is the man who works so diligently and rises to the top, and now... He's in a place of leadership, second in command in all of Egypt. God's done an amazing thing in his life. He's got great responsibility. And over the last many years of his life that we looked at, he was busy fulfilling other people's dreams, probably wondering if God would ever bring fulfillment to his dream. The one where he saw his brothers bowing down to him and giving him honor. And tribute. Now, if you're like me, years of waiting, years of struggle, years of frustration could develop inside of you a sense of bitterness and angst and frustration. That's that's my bit. That's where I lean towards. You know, there's a man who went in to the doctor, and the doctor said, I'm so sorry. The diagnosis has come back. You have got a form of rabies. And the man looked at the doctor and said, well, I need a piece of paper and a pen. The doctor said, you don't need to write out your last will and testament. You'll be okay. He said, no, that's not my plan. I want to write down a list of all the people I want to bite. <laughs> I'm a little bit more like that guy. Now, I'd like to get back at people. And bitterness can set in when there's unforgiveness. Oh, bitterness is dark. It's heavy. It's consuming. <clears throat> it's a struggle. And the, the thing about bitterness is it's got to be removed. Now, when I got married to my wife, Tasha, we were about to go on our honeymoon. And the doctor told me that I had a root canal. Went into the dentist, and I was in that transition where I was getting out of college. I wasn't on my parents' dental insurance. Uh, I didn't have a wife yet or a date <coughs> And the combination of the two of those have been very helpful in my marriage. But uh, I hadn't gone to the dentist in forever, so I needed a root canal. And the dentist who had been my lifelong dentist, I grew up with his son, we were great friends. He, when I worked at Einstein's, he'd come visit me and I'd give him bagels. He said, Jared, this is going to cost like $800. You don't have insurance. I said, guess what else I don't have? $800. <laughs> so I'd like to give you this as a wedding gift. I'll do a root canal for free. Yeah. <laughs> because my tooth was throbbing and the pain was very strong. And I was going on a cruise for the first time in my life, and I heard about all the food on a cruise. I was excited about that. And I wanted to eat and enjoy. So he brings me in on a Friday. Nobody's in there. The lights are down dark. And he goes at my tooth and starts digging away. you gotta, you got to root it all out. you got to get all of the infection out. And then they put filling in. That's what a root canal does. And they, they've got all these instruments. And they're very thin, but they're very powerful. And... About 30 minutes into the root canal, I hear, uh-oh, <laughs> and I hear, uh, uh-oh, uh-oh, what's going on? And he keeps working, and then he just puts his devices down, he takes his mask off, he raises my chair and says, listen, this actually happens more often than you would imagine, but I broke a piece of the instrument off in your tooth. And for the last 30 minutes, I've been trying to get it out. And that was the uh-oh moment. And so, uh, to this day, I got an x-ray this year. I went to the dentist. I go regularly because I have a day planner and a wife. And uh, I have a picture of my tooth right here. And that's the piece of filament that's stuck in my tooth. 
Now I had some options. I could drill up through my mouth where lots of nerves come in and uh, could leave me with some paralysis in the face. And I said, well, Doc, I, I kind of speak for a living. I'm a pastor. I know God could use me, but I'm going to skip that option. Or we could cap it off and just leave it in there. I was like, okay. Well, what's what's going to happen if that, I do that? Well, uh, there's a possibility that you just have to have the tooth removed at one point because uh, you know, infection will set in again at some point and you'll have that throbbing pain again. So if you're not going to go in and remove the piece, um, it should be okay. You know, we could do this for a couple decades maybe. But eventually, you're going to have to have it removed if it causes any kinds of problems. And so I capped it, and I've been married 12 years coming up in August. That's exciting. And so uh, it's, still, it's still there. But here's the thing. This little tooth gives me a picture of what bitterness will do. We can try things. We can cap it off. We can try and work around it. We can even be very drastic and try and drill in and, and, and take it out through the, 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 the problems that, that you face. But eventually it's going to have to be removed because it's going to cause problems. And that is so true of our lives when it comes to bitterness. See, bitterness and forgiveness, they will follow you throughout your life. And bitterness always replaces forgiveness. But forgiveness erases bitterness. Forgiveness is what will remove the root problem, bitterness in our lives. And Joseph, we learn from this story of his life that he chose to be set free from bitterness through forgiveness. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to see something in Genesis chapter 41. Okay, Genesis chapter 41. <coughs> Joseph, he's moving on up, baby. He is in charge. He is taking the reins. And he's able to now have a life for the first time. He's getting leadership, recognition. And he gets to have a family. I mean, how exciting is this for Joseph? Things are really looking up for him. The turnaround has occurred. In, in Genesis chapter 41, verse 51, it says, Joseph called for the name of the firstborn, Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardships and, and all of my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. In the midst of his suffering and affliction, he has these two children. And he gives them these very powerful names. Names that have meaning. You know, today, names, they don't have nearly as much meaning as they did back then. These names represent the past and they establish the future of the person with a name such as this. And Joseph is crying out in verse 51. His plea in the midst of his suffering. He is letting it be known. God has made me forget all of my hardships. In all my father's house. Joseph is saying here. That he is able to let go of what has happened to him. The old saying about forgiving and forgetting. Some of us say, I forgive you, but we don't really forget. I think there's a difference between forgetting and forgetting to remember. Because we don't have the ability the way God does to throw sin and indiscretion as far as the east is from the west. We don't have that capability. But we do have the capability to not hold past mistakes in today's present. Things that have already been forgiven. But for Joseph, he didn't allow bitterness to set in because he was willing to forget. 
forgive. To let this go. And I, I find it very interesting that the second born, the child, his name means for God has made me fruitful in the land of my afflictions. If you're holding on to bitterness in your family, with your friends, at work, it's going to be very difficult for you to be fruitful. It's going to be very difficult for you to bear fruit in this world because that bitterness will consume you. And I, I think that we get into these situations where, where either we hurt someone else and we're having a really hard time getting over the fact that we hurt them and they haven't forgiven us yet or they're treating us different because of our actions and as a result, we're still holding on to the past and it affects our present and our future or, or maybe we've been hurt by somebody else. Somebody has <coughs> hurt us and we can't forgive them. We just won't. Sorry, it was too messy. Or, or maybe even we don't forgive ourselves for what we did. We did something so bad, so wrong, so evil, we hold on to it. And every time we drive by that person's house or that place of business that recalls to memory what we did, the guilt comes rushing in. Broken marriages, failed relationships, friendships that have gone under, relationships that have been destroyed by bitterness. There's no fruit in those relationships. When you're solely focused on the pain and the difficulty, your mind is totally consumed by it. The capacity of your brain is being totally directed towards this bitterness. It doesn't free you up to be creative, to overcome obstacles, to you know, forge out new ground, to take the step forward. So Joseph, he gives names to these children that he probably wasn't sure he would ever have. He's got no rights as a slave, no access to building and creating a life in prison. These kids are a reflection of his life that he's lived, a life marked by forgiveness. And out of it comes this great fruit, incredible amounts of payoff. This is out of verse 56, it says, So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, or sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all of the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all of the earth. There's great fruitfulness here that takes place. And this is where we left off last week. And the rest of Joseph's life is a life of success and his dreams coming true. Because of the famine all over the world and the word had gotten out, people raced back down to Egypt, including his family and ten of his brothers. There was twelve sons, the tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, who would later become Israel. Ten of them come. Benjamin's left behind. And Joseph he likes to toy with his brothers. I like that about Joseph. I can relate to that. I would be doing the same. And they go through a process where eventually the family makes it all the way back. And everybody's present. And everybody bows down and pays tribute to Joseph. And in Genesis chapter 50, we see things come to a close. And it's a little bit of a flashback. Verse 15 says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions of your brothers in their sin because they did evil to you. 
And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to them. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for, I, for am I in the place of, uh, place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke to them kindly. And Joseph gets to save the day. And instead of allowing bitterness to consume him and take over, he chooses forgiveness. And forgiveness always erases bitterness. And as a result... Joseph saves his family, and the, the lineage of Israel continues in the midst of a famine. He doesn't hold their sins against them. He forgives them. And he has perspective about this. I mean, when we go through trials and suffering... It's usually not till we're on the other side that we gain perspective. That's why there's that saying, hindsight is 20-20. You're able to see more clearly down the road. Most of us let anxiety take over, and we start to allow fear to set in. What are we going to do? How are we going to solve this? But Joseph had perspective because of his trust in the Lord. He remembered that success was a gift from God. His favor came from the Lord. And so his perspective was solely focused on God. God gave him the perspective to be able to forgive. Is there anybody in your life that's harmed you? That's sinned against you? That's really done a number on you? I mean, I've heard some stories. I've heard some stories about ex-spouses that as far away as you get away from them, it keeps coming. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. The pain is still there. I've heard some very disturbing stories about work environments, pressure, racism, Beating people down verbally and emotionally. I've heard some stories about teenagers at school who have been totally destroyed online and in person. Is there anybody in your life that has done something so bad to you that every time you think of their name, you wonder if you'll ever be able to forgive them? Maybe you know of somebody in your life. They've got something against you. They've never said it to your face. They've only talked behind your back. The word got back to you. In Matthew chapter 18, if you've got your Bibles, flip over to Matthew 18 with me. We move from Joseph, this 30-year-old who started his career, who was faced with affliction, who was scorned and beaten down, but was able to save his family, to now Jesus, as we said last week. The same one who started his ministry at 30, who was rejected by some of those people that he loved so dearly. And in Matthew chapter 18, we see this story unfold about forgiveness. You can follow along on the screens with me. It says in verse 15, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. <coughs> Jesus, who would be abandoned by his closest friends. Jesus, 
who would be beaten and thrown up on a cross as an innocent man. Jesus understood forgiveness. And it, it's not like this came easy for Jesus. We've got this high priest. He is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he went through the things of life that we went through. And he was without sin. He didn't sin. And Jesus in the garden is praying to God, God, I know that this is your plan. Father, I know that this is the way that the cross is going to happen. I have to go through suffering for the sins of humanity, to be their substitution, to stand in their place, to take the pain on myself for them. But if there's any other way, could you allow this cup to pass from me? I mean, Jesus, he felt the tug too, the tension that we feel as well. And his words to us are forgive. In Colossians 3, verse 13, it says this. This is Paul. We've got Joseph, this historic figure. Jesus, our Savior. Paul, who's been transformed by Jesus. And he says, bearing with one another, if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And Paul, in Galatians 6, 1, he says this. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted as well. I like this. Paul on one hand says, hey, God's forgiven you. You should forgive those around you. And if people, if they're sinning against you, if they're doing wrong, if they're harming others, go to them and gently restore them. I think that's the picture of forgiveness. Jesus could have dealt with us more harshly. But in Romans chapter 2, it says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. We need to follow that example in forgiveness. Now, my parents have shown me what a great marriage could look like. They have. My parents, Mike and Pam Bridge. Today is their 40th wedding anniversary. <laughs> They got married when they were 11. <laughs> Give or take. Decade. So it's amazing that today is a day we get to talk about forgiveness. Because I've been married for almost 12 years, and when new couples come in and say, we fight, we just argue, we bicker with each other, and we're fighting out, we're, just, we're not sure if this is going to work out. And I said, well, welcome to marriage. And they look at me really strange when I tell them, I think I fight with my wife every day. <laughs> Maybe every other day. These aren't like fights and yelling. These are disagreements. These are uh, differences of opinion. These are issues of my way versus her way, right? That's what I mean by fight regularly. But there's some kind of need for resolution every single day. Because we're people. And we have a pulse. And so we have opinions that we hold on to pretty strongly. But what I watched my mom and dad do, and what I learned was, if you've got a fight, work it out. Forgive each other. I mean, my parents, they are the epitome of like a cute couple that have been married for 40 years. And they should just be 85 and let's go up to, you know, you know, being married for 80 years kind of thing or something, whatever. Because they are that cute little couple. Yesterday, we were at my kid's soccer game and it was cold and my mom was like, ooh, I could use a blanket. You know, that's, that's, that's a wife speak for, honey, go get me a blanket. And, um, and, and my dad just looks at her and says, oh, I don't know if we have any blankets, but I'll go to check. And he knows there's no blanket in his car. He's a man. Men don't carry blankets in their car. We carry jumper cables and rope and exacto blades in our cars, okay? And he goes out and he comes back with like winter gloves and the sun visor to cover my mom. 
And my mom's so cute about it. She could have meant, this is not a blanket. I don't think so. I am not going to wear a sun visor at my grandkids' soccer game. People are going to think we're alien, weird, crazy. But she just turned it around, covered up her little legs. Said, thank you, honey. She didn't cause a fight. She didn't cause a stir. Just move on. Now, they're not perfect. The marriage isn't perfect. I'm not perfect. My marriage isn't perfect. But because of what Jesus has done in my life, I know these very clear principles. You can't ignore fights. They will come. You have to resolve those fights. Or bitterness wins. And so we, as a people... We've got to come together and follow the example of Joseph and our Savior Jesus and seek forgiveness and extend forgiveness. Today, I think some of us maybe need to send a text message to someone that has done something to us that has never even asked for forgiveness and say, I love you. I forgive you. Let's move forward. Today, I think some of us maybe need to make a phone call to someone that we've hurt. And we thought it no big deal. We were just making fun of them. That's just my personality. I'm a little sarcastic in nature. But ever since I made fun of them in front of everybody at work, they've stopped hanging out with me. We might need to ask for forgiveness. Today, some of us need to come before a righteous, almighty God who was perfect in every way <coughs> and did nothing to deserve a death so gruesome that the hair on his face would be ripped from his face, that he would be pierced in his side, beaten on his back, and left on a cross to suffocate and die. And we need to say to that God, thank you for forgiving me. You're not holding on to this anymore. I need to let go. I need to forgive myself because you've already forgiven me. And today, we thought that it would be fitting as a church family to remember what Christ did for us, to take communion, to remind ourselves that we might not feel worthy of forgiveness, but Jesus has forgiven us. And as a result of his gift, we can show others forgiveness. Let's pray together. God, we come to you, Lord. <clears throat> And we realize that there's a lot of drastic things that have happened. Stories that match up with Joseph's life. Well, there's a lot of affliction and suffering and pain as a result of really nasty things that have been done. But God, we can't afford to let bitterness sit in. We can't afford to let bitterness take root. We can't afford to just ignore the bitterness. We've got to remove it and erase it with forgiveness. So Jesus, we're here this morning to say thank you. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for going to the cross in our place and dying so that we might actually have life as a result of your death and resurrection. A hope for heaven and all of eternity. And we don't have to walk around with the weight of bitterness anymore. So as we prepare our hearts and our minds as Christians to take communion, to remember that your body was bruised and beaten, and your blood was shed on our behalf to not only cover but remove our sins. Lord, we want to remember forgiveness. And so if there's anybody in our lives right now that we've never really extended forgiveness to in our, in our hearts, we ask for that right now from you. Lord, we ask that we can just let it go. We can be like Joseph, where we're going to be naming our kids. Forget and fruit. Because we don't want to live unproductive lives. We want to live lives that make a difference and impact the world and join you in your expansion of your kingdom and the building of your church. So God, we don't want to let bitterness to keep us 
from growth in our own lives spiritually and as a community of believers. We give it to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand. And as you stand, we're going to sing a song. The band's going to lead us. And the words of the song is the gospel. And it will remind you of what God has done for you. And if you're a follower of Christ, we invite you to make your way to our communion table as you see fit to, to grab a piece of bread. We have gluten-free in the silver bag if you need them. To grab a cup of juice and make your way back to your chair. <coughs> And as you hold the elements of the Lord's Supper, be reminded of the forgiveness that you've received as a follower of Christ and the forgiveness that you need to give. Because there's great power in forgiveness. I've seen marriages flip totally on around because of forgiveness. I've seen friendships restored because of forgiveness. So grab the elements and remember what Christ has done for you. And think about who it is in your life that you maybe need to extend forgiveness to. Jesus, your blood, it washes me. Thank you. 
that each person should examine their own life. And that's what we did as we sang and prayed, remembering what God has done for us. If there's any sin in our lives that's been unconfessed or we've never asked God to forgive us before we take communion, that we ask God for forgiveness of sin. We say, Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner. I've done and said so many things that have hurt you and rebelled against you and harmed others and myself. God, I'm sorry. Thank you for the gift of your grace, your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Bible says if you're not a follower of Christ, to exclude from taking of the elements. It's a warning. So that's okay. If you're here with a friend or just seeking and not sure about who Jesus is yet, we just invite you to join in and watch with us. But for us as followers of Christ who claim the forgiveness of God, this is our chance to say thank you. Remember that his body was broken for us. Take the bread as you remember his body being broken for you. And the juice that represents the wine that was given at the Lord's Supper, this is a representation of the blood of Christ being poured out for us. Take this in remembrance of him. Well, we thank you guys for coming and celebrating with us what Jesus has done for us. Now let's be those who go live out the freedom of forgiveness and show others forgiveness this very week. We invite you to come back next week and bring a friend with you. We're going to be starting a brand new series called Cultivate Your Faith, a study on the book of James. Well, we'll study verse by verse in the book of James. So come, bring a friend, come explore with us what God has in store. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you next week.